the Corpus Hermeticum is a collection of mystical texts that date to the early centuries of the Common Era. The text is attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, a syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. The style of the text is a series of sermons given by Hermes, usually involving one of his students, Asclepius, Tat, and Ammon, whose names are derived from the Egyptian Imhotep, Thoth, and Amun, respectively. In the following video we present a simplified abridgment of the text, while attempting to preserve some of the romanticism present in the arcane and cryptic prose. Due to the varied lengths of the treatises, the entire text is presented in this video as a single narrative, and the start of a new treatise will be signalled on the screen. I hope you enjoy. While meditating on the world, I was lifted to a higher level and a vast being called out to me, asking what I wanted to learn. The being introduced himself as Poimandres, the mind or noose of all masterhood, and offered to teach me what I desired to know about the nature of things and God. A vision appeared before me, filled with limitless light and some darkness that resembled a coiled snake. The darkness transformed into a moist, chaotic nature, and a voice of fire emerged from it. Then a holy word descended from the light and transformed the moist nature into pure fire, followed by air and earth and water. Poimandres proceeds to explain that the light was God, mind, and the Logos, and that the Logos was the Son of God. He showed me a vision of the light in countless powers, and a cosmos that was beyond comprehension. The archetypal form exists in mind before the beginning of time. Nature's elements come from the will of God, and copy the cosmos beautiful to create their own cosmos. God the mind creates another mind to give form to things. This mind forms seven rulers, who are the archons of the seven planets, that enclose the cosmos and are known as fate. God's reason merges with nature's pure formation, leaving the lower elements as pure reasonless matter. The formative mind sets in motion the spinning of the spheres from beginning to endless end. Earth produces living creatures according to mind's will. All father mind brings forth man, co-equal and beautiful, with whom he falls in love, and gives all of his own formations. Man is granted authority over the irrational lives of the cosmos. He breaks through the boundary of their spheres and shows nature God's fair form, which she loves. Nature and man thus become lovers and are intermingled. Humans are both mortal and immortal. They are subject to fate and suffering like mortals, yet have power over all. Nature and man brought forth seven men in correspondence with the seven natures of fire and spirit. Man was made from light and life, changing into soul and mind. All creatures were multiplied according to their kind. Man learned that he is deathless, and that the cause of death is love. Couplings and generations were founded by fate and harmony. Those who learn to know themselves reach that good which transcends abundance, while those who expend love upon their body stay wandering in darkness, and suffer through their sense of death. The ignorant are deprived of deathlessness because the gloomy darkness is the root and base of the material frame. From matter came the moist nature, which composed the body in the sense world, and from this body death drains the water. God is made of light and life, and man was born from him. To return to life, one must realize they are made of, and come from, light and life. Mind is present in holy and good men, and aids them in gaining knowledge of all things, and in winning the Father's love. The wicked and depraved are far from mind and yield to the avenging daemon, who torments them and adds fire upon them. Mind teaches about the nature of the way above. One must surrender the material body to the work of change, and let go of the body's senses and passions. Man moves upwards through the zones by de-energizing negative traits and energies. The journey ends in the eighth nature, where man becomes one with God. Those who reach the eighth nature become powers in God. Spread the word and show the way to God. People are urged to repent and to forsake ignorance and destruction so that they may achieve deathlessness. Some people ignore the teaching, while others beg to be taught. They are taught the words of wisdom and how to be saved. They drink from the deathless water and give thanks to God before returning to their places of rest. And thus, Hermes said, I was filled with joy and gratitude for the awakening of my soul and true vision through Poimandres' teachings. 
I offer my pure reason and heart to God, who perfects itself through its own powers, and made all things consist by the word. You are more powerful than all, transcending all preeminence and better than all praise. I pray for never failing in gnosis, our common being's nature, and to be filled with your power and grace so that I may give light to my brethren and thy sons. Blessed art thou, O Father. Later, Hermes is talking to his son, Asclepius. He asks Asclepius whether all that moves is moved by something greater and of a different nature. He proceeds to explain that the cosmos, a vast and massive body, moves within a space that is bodiless and godlike, or God himself. All things that move, Hermes says, are moved by something stationary, and the rest of motion is created by the resistance of the cosmos against the celestial spheres. Furthermore, motion is caused by something interior, such as soul or spirit, with animate things moving lifeless things. Void does not exist, as all things that seem empty are full of air and spirit. The space within which all things move is bodiless, and referred to as mind and reason, or nous and logos, which are free from all body and error. God alone, who is the cause of all things, can be called the good and father, and no other gods or spirits can be good. The greatness of the good is as powerful as the being of all things that exist. God is the creator of all things that exists, and nothing exists without God. Again, only God is truly good, while other immortal beings are only called gods out of ignorance. God is also known as Father because he creates all things. The role of the Father is to make, and so child-making is also a most pious deed on earth. Those without children are punished in the afterlife, condemned to a body with neither man's nor woman's nature. God is the source of all things, including mind and nature. In the beginning chaos reigned until God brought forth holy light and separated the elements to create the universe. Seven circles of heaven were visible, each with their appointed gods, who brought forth all creatures and living things. Humans were created to observe and learn from the marvels of heaven and the works of God. The cyclic gods govern human fate and their deeds are memorialized on earth. Though all things decay, renewal comes from the renovation of the gods and the turning of nature's rhythmic wheel. The Godhead continually makes anew the cosmic mixture with nature co-established within it. Later, Hermes is talking to his other son, Tat. He explains to Tat that the world-maker created the universe with reason, or logos, not hands. He created all beings by his will, and adorned his inextensible and unique body by setting its earth in order. Man, a life that cannot die but still dies, was sent down to earth as a cosmos of the divine frame, excelling over all other lives due to reason and mind, logos and nous. And so, man strives to know the author of God's works. God sent a cup filled with mind down to earth as a prize for souls. Those who understand and baptize themselves in mind become partakers in the gnosis, which is the knowledge of man's divine nature, thus becoming made perfect men. Those who do not understand possess reason but not mind, and center their thoughts upon bodily pleasures. Those who have received God's gift have won their release from death's bonds. They embrace all things in their own mind. They have sight of the good, and speed their way unto the one and only one. The gnosis of mind is the vision of things divine and the knowledge of God. To be baptized in the cup of mind, one must first hate their body and love their self, for then they shall have mind and share in the gnosis. Choosing the better leads to becoming godly and showing piety to God. Choosing the worse only disturbs God's harmony and leads to a life of following bodily pleasures. Our path to God is through many bodies, choirs of daemons and star courses. The good is infinite without beginning or end, and gnosis is the beginning of knowing it. The oneness is the source and root of all, perfect and without increase or decrease. God's image can guide us on the path to God, drawing us in like a magnet to iron. God is both unmanifest and manifest, and beyond all names. He is ever-present, yet not made present, for he is not made himself. By thinking about manifestation, he thinketh all things manifest. He manifests through all things, and in all. To see the unmanifest, pray to our Lord and Father for the power of thought. If you have the power, he will manifest to your mind's eyes. 
The maker and lord of all things is essential to uphold the order of the cosmos. Consider the sun, moon, and stars, to understand the one who watches over their order. Without a lord there could be no order, and even the orderless requires a lord. To see the earth, sea, air, fire, and stars sway would be a blessed sight. This order of the cosmos is created by the unmanifest made manifest. God creates all things, including humans, with perfect measure. He is greater than all, and the father of them all. Behold the many beautiful and diverse works of God made with perfect measure. Only God, the unmanifest creator of all things, could have made them all. God's being is the conception and creation of all things. He must continually create everything, for without him nothing can exist. He is both the things that are, and the things that are not, and all things are in him. O Father, shall I hymn thee, for you are everything, and everything is in you. You are mind when you think, Father when you make, God when you act, and the good and maker of all things. God is good, and good is God. The good is eternal and stable, and nothing else can supply all that it can. Good cannot be found in anything else, as all other things contain both good and bad. The cosmos is good in so far as it makes all things, but it is not good in all other aspects. Good cannot exist in humans, as they are bound by bad, pain, and desire. Good cannot be contained in a material body fouled with bad. The greatest ill is the belief that things which are bad are actually good, and the even greater ill is the lust for bodily pleasures that leads us away from good. The essence of the good is the beautiful, which is of God. To seek God is to seek the beautiful, and the path to it is devotion joined with gnosis. Those who do not follow the path of devotion and gnosis call things beautiful and good, even though they are enveloped in bad. These things are hard to live without, but we must not mistake them for the true essences of the beautiful and good. Awaken from ignorance those who can. It shrouds the earth, ensnaring souls in bodies and hindering salvation. Seek salvation and the gates of knowledge, where clear light shines and souls are sober. Discard the cloak of ignorance and darkness to see the truth and reject evil. Ignorance is a loathsome veil that clouds the senses and fills them with desire, hindering one's ability to hear and see what should be heard and seen. Over the next three days Hermes gives three sermons to Asclepius and Tat. He begins by explaining, The soul is deathless, and man is a rational part of the immortal cosmos created and sustained by God. The Father, eternal and transcending, made the universe and endowed it with deathlessness. The lives of living creatures were sown into the universal body to order forth life. Heavenly bodies preserve order, and their restoration is their composition. Man, made in the image of the cosmos, conceives of God as bodiless and as the good mind. All things are by and in God, who is the source, limit, and constitution of all things. Hermes says that he will now explain the sermon about sense, which is distinct from thought. Both are present in humans, while for other beings, sense is only a part of nature. Sensing and thinking are intertwined, being necessary for each other. Mind conceives all thoughts, and the seeds of God lead to virtuous thoughts. The gnosis of God may lead to persecution, but transforms the bad into good. The cosmic course can be both good and bad, influencing the process of becoming like God. The cosmos creates, absorbs, and renews all things, with bodies being composed of different elements. God is the father and source of all things, while the cosmos is the son who orders them. All things exist in God, and understanding leads to belief. The mind has the power to come to truth, which is credible to those who understand it. Hermes explains to Tat the nature of God, the good, and the cosmos. The good, he says, is the creator and the cause of everything, and it wills to be known. The energy of God is his will, and his essence is to will the being of all things. To perceive the divine, one must focus solely on it, stilling all senses and motions. The soul can become like God through contemplation of the beauty of the good, and the gnosis of the good is attained through holy silence. Ignorance is the vice of the soul, while gnosis is its virtue. 
A soul that persists in vice and ignorance cannot attain deathlessness or the good. The senses are necessary for knowledge, but true knowledge is obtained through the mind. The cosmos is beautiful but not good, as it is material and subject to change. It is the genesis of qualities and quantities, and its being is in becoming. The universe is made up of both material and non-material elements, with the non-material element being responsible for moving the material element in a sphere-like way. The soul is the source of life, and the principles of man are mind, reason, soul, spirit, and body. The spirit gives motion to the body, but at death it withdraws into the soul, and the living creature dies. There is one source from which all things depend, and its three names are God, the Father, and the Good. God contains the cosmos, and the cosmos contains man. The only way to salvation is through God's gnosis. The soul is beautiful, but it loses touch with the beautiful and the good as the body grows. At death, the soul withdraws into itself, and the mind and spirit separate from the soul. The mind takes on a fiery body and traverses space while the soul faces judgment. The impious soul is punished through violence and wrongdoing, while the pious soul is guided towards goodness and blessings. Pray for the good mind, for the soul cannot regress. Humans are divine creatures even greater than gods in power. The dispensation of all things arises by means of cosmos and man, but by the one. Later, Poimandres, the divine mind, or noose, returned to Hermes, who proceeded to ask for clarification on the truth about God and the good. Mind proceeds to explain. God creates Aeon, which is the timeless and spaceless realm of ideal being. Aeon then creates Cosmos, which is the principle of order, and Cosmos creates time, which creates becoming. The good is the essence of God. Sameness is the essence of Aeon. Order is the essence of Cosmos. Change is the essence of time, and life and death are the essence of becoming. The energies of each entity are mind and soul for God, lastingness and deathlessness for Aeon, restoration and the opposite thereof for Cosmos, increase and decrease for time, and quality for becoming. God is the source of all, Aeon is their essence, and Cosmos is their matter. Aeon's power is the source of Cosmos, and it imparts deathlessness and lastingness to matter. Genesis and time have two natures, unchangeable and indestructible in heaven, and subject to change and destruction on earth. The soul of Aeon is God, the soul of Cosmos is Aeon, and the soul of earth is heaven. All things are through Aeon, and the body is full of soul and mind which is full of God. Life fills the all from within, and encircles Cosmos from without, continuing in sameness above in heaven, and changing below on earth. Aeon preserves the cosmos through God's energy, which is unlike anything. God is not inactive, as all things are full of God. All things are made by God's power and are subject to Him, though He is not independent of them. The cosmos is beautiful and ordered by Aeon. The moon is the forerunner of the subject worlds, while the earth is the foundation of the cosmos and nurtures life. Every living body consists of both soul and matter. Living things have souls but non-living things don't. Only God can put soul into living things, for he is the only one who can create life. God cannot be inactive, because if he were, it would make him imperfect. Understanding the work of begetting requires experiencing it. God works alone, and if separated from it, all things would collapse and die. Since all things are lives and life is one, then one is God. Death dissolves the union of mind and soul, but does not destroy them. Aeon is God's image, Cosmos is Aeon's, the Sun is Cosmos's, and Man is the Sun's. Change is called death when the body dissolves, and life when it withdraws to the unmanifest. The Cosmos also changes, but it is not dissolved. God has one idea that is bodiless, and manifests all ideas through bodies. The form of God's idea is like the form of reason, and mountain tops in pictures. God cannot live without doing good which is the life and motion of God. Hermes tells Tat that mind is of God's essence, and in humans the mind is God. The mind rescues the soul from the passions of the body, acting as a physician. Souls without the mind are irrational and subject to fate. Those led by reason suffer less and can avoid vice and suffering. Mind is the ruler of all things, and nothing is impossible for it. 
Passion differs from passibility, which is the ability to feel. Freeing oneself from the body frees oneself from passion. God has given humans mind and speech, which can guide them to the choir of gods and blessed ones after death if used properly. Hermes tells Tat that reason is within the mind, which is within God. The cosmos is the image of the Mighty One filled with life. Everything in it is alive and immortal. Death is impossible because everything has motion and dissolves as compound bodies, rather than being destroyed. God communicates through visions and signs and energizes everything. To worship God, one must avoid being bad, as God permeates everything and is manifested in the orderly behavior of the universe. Tat asks Hermes for clarification on rebirth, which the thrice greatest one promised to teach him once he had become a stranger to the world illusion. Hermes explains that man is born from wisdom, silence, and the true good, and that the sower is the will of God. The begotten is composed of all powers and is God's son. Tat asks for a more direct explanation, but Hermes says that it can only be experienced through the simple vision brought to birth out of God's mercy. It cannot be seen by the senses, and the one who experiences it is no longer touched, but has touch, dimension, and is born in mind. Hermes instructs Tat to withdraw into himself and to purge his senses and torments of material things, so that he may perceive the birth of divinity within. He lists twelve torments including not knowing, grief, intemperance, concupiscence, unrighteousness, avarice, error, envy, guile, anger, rashness, and malice. Hermes tells Tat to keep silent and that they are being purified for the articulation of reason, or logos. Gnosis of God and joy have come to them, and with their coming, not knowing and sorrow are cast out. He invokes the powers of self-control, continence, righteousness, sharing with all, and truth, which chase away the torments of intemperance, desire, unrighteousness, avarice, and error. Hermes explains that the measure of the good is full upon truth's coming, and that all torments of darkness have fled. When the ten powers overcome the twelve torments, intellectual birth is complete, and we become gods by abandoning the body's senses and realizing ourselves as beings of light and life. This brings us great joy. The human body is made up of twelve types of life, which are one in nature but deluded in perception. The ten powers naturally overcome the twelve, since the ten gives birth to souls and unites life and light. The one contains the ten, and the ten contains the one. And thus, Tat learns to see all things with the power of his mind, and says, I am everywhere, in heaven, earth, water, air, animals, plants, before and after birth. And he learns that rebirth is to see things with the mind, not just the body. The natural body will dissolve and die, but our essential birth as gods cannot. And Tat says, Let every part of the world listen to my hymn. I will praise the Lord who created everything and established the earth, the heavens, and the ocean. All powers within me, let's sing together. Let my praises be acceptable to God, the sire of all. Tat desired to learn more about the nature of things, and so Hermes explains more to him. He begins, There must be a supreme ancient maker who rules over the making of all things, as everything is made by something else. This maker, who cannot be seen, we shall call God, maker, and father. Yet we must understand the difference between the made and the maker, as there is no middle term. All things are either made or the maker. We should always remember the maker and the made in all things, without regard for things above, below, divine, or changing. Nevertheless, the maker and the made are inseparable, and one cannot exist without the other. The maker is alone, simple, and uncompounded, and all things must be made by the maker. The making God is the leader, and everything else is the follower. Do not reject things based on their variety, for God's glory lies in making all things. The imperfections in them are not a reflection of God's character, and it is the continuity of being made that causes them to lose their shine. God created change to refresh the process. It is ignorant and impious to deny God's role as the creator of all things, as God's only passion is goodness, which is neither arrogant nor impotent. He has the power to create everything, and he is like a farmer planting different seeds and trees. 
He sows immortality in heaven, change on earth, and life and motion in the universe. God's creation has four elements, God himself, Genesis, and the two principles of immortality and change. After Tat and Asclepius received Hermes's sermons, Asclepius delivers his own sermon to King Ammon. Asclepius explains, This sermon is the essence of all that has been said in previous sermons, and will challenge many beliefs. The sermon will preserve the power and clarity of the original language, Egyptian, against the superficiality of Greek language. I begin the sermon with an invocation to God, the Lord and Maker of the universe, who is both all and one. All and one are not separate, and they must remain one to preserve the fullness of all things. In earth there are fountains of water, fire, and earth, all coming from the same source. The sun, which is the demiurge, orders heaven and earth, pouring out essence and taking up matter. The sun's energies extend to earth and all its depths. The substance that only the mind can grasp is the sun's own substance, which is a reservoir of light. Its origin is unknown, but the sun is near to God in nature. The sun shines in great splendor throughout the cosmos above and below. He holds the cosmic team in line, using life, soul, spirit, deathlessness, and genesis as reins. The sun distributes perpetual permanence to the immortals, and nourishes the deathless parts of the cosmos with his light. He vivifies and keeps in movement the animals in the lower parts of the cosmos. God's power to give life is continuous, and daemons work under him to watch over human affairs and carry out punishments for impiety. The duty of the gods is to give benefits, mankind's duty is to give worship, and the daemons' duty is to give requital. Impiety is the only thing held against humans. The choir of daemons is arranged underneath the stars, with their varied natures giving them authority over things on earth, causing confusion and turmoil. They shape our souls and set them in motion, affecting our nerves, marrow, veins, arteries, and brain, down to the heart. Only a few have a direct connection to God, protecting them from the influence of daemons. Others are controlled by daemons and subject to their whims. The intelligible world comes from God, and the sensible world comes from the intelligible world. The sun pours out the stream of divine goodness through both worlds. God is the Father of all, the Son is the Creator of all, and the Cosmos is the tool used for creation. The intelligible essence controls heaven, the gods control the daemons, and the daemons control humans. All are parts of God, and everything God creates is a part of Himself. As God is ceaseless, His making has no beginning or end. Asclepius explains to the king that there are things that appear bodiless, like reflections in mirrors and forms, and that these reflections occur between the sensible and intelligible worlds. Asclepius advises the king to worship these images, which have their forms from the intelligible world. God is a natural musician, who creates endless harmony and rhythm without tiring. In music blame the instrument, not the inspiration of the music maker. Similarly, don't blame the body for impiousness, as God is an unwearied spirit who generously bestows joyful gifts. Blame the string, not the demiurge, if there's a lack of matter to perfect his skillfulness. The worse the instrument, the more reputation the music maker gains by striking the proper note. An artist trained in noble themes can use themselves as an instrument and create magnificence through mysteries. We should praise God first, and then kings, in an orderly progression. God is the greatest king, everlasting and victorious but all kings are praised for their lordship and prowess in war, and even foreign lands tremble before them. Our discourse ends with the better one and the divinest of kings who brings us peace. Receive wisdom from the better one, and direct it back to him for blessings. Though we may not properly praise the pure God, acknowledging his limitless power is the ultimate blessing. It is our duty as children of the king to praise him and ask for pardon for our inadequacy. God is good, deathless, eternal, and continuously sends messages urging us to praise Him and return to Him. All beings are united in thought and passion through love. Praise kings as a way of training ourselves in pious service and in practicing praise. Kings bring peace and prosperity, and are symbols of peace that restrain enemies and provide safety. Show gratitude to them for their contribution to peace and prosperity. And that brings us to the end of the Corpus Hermeticum.
I hope this video portrayed to you the essential message of this earliest hermetic text, and I implore you to explore the full work for the finer details that this abridgment was unable to capture. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn notifications on. If you'd like to support the channel in our goal of making complex texts from philosophy, psychology and esoteric traditions accessible to a wider audience, please consider sharing this video with a friend or buying us a coffee through the link in the description. Thank you again for listening, and I look forward to seeing you again.